Good morning and welcome to today's OnePath Exec Tech Live webinar. Today's session is entitled Closing the Gaps on Cybersecurity, a Client Perspective. My name is Ted Hulsey and I'm your host for today's event. Two quick housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be circulated to all registrants. Thank you for joining in for the live session. We encourage everyone to ask questions as we go along and we will try to address your questions on the fly. Now let me introduce our speakers. Peter Gilberti is OnePath's general manager in the Boston, Massachusetts office. Peter, welcome. Thank you. Um, Carl Varchetti is one is a OnePath client and the firm manager with Rusen, Varchetti, and Olivier. Carl, welcome. Thank you. And Scott Ostergaard is OnePath's director of Global Knock. Scott, welcome to the discussion. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. And Anthony Perez is a OnePath security analyst. Anthony, welcome. Hey, good morning. And last but not least, Dave Kleinetland is a senior security engineer with Huntress Labs. Dave, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Should be a good chat. Okay, let's talk about today's discussion. Um, we are going to look at the various challenges businesses face in today's threat landscape. We'll specifically discuss how a layered approach to security is vital. We'll also explore why advanced persistent threats are so challenging and how endpoint threat detection and response can play a role in a defense in depth strategy. So let's get into the conversation. Um, we wanted to start things off with some perspective from Peter. Um, Peter, you were the general manager up in Boston. Um, what, are, what are you seeing from clients, from OnePath clients? What are some of the struggles they're having with security? What are some of the conversations you're having? Right. Well, thank you, Ted, and I want to thank everybody for, for, for joining us today, as well as the, the panel. Appreciate everybody's attendance and uh, participation, right? So uh, it's a great question. So some of the things that we are starting to see with our OnePath clients, uh, if, you, if you rewind a year, it's far different, right? They're, they're listening more and more to what's in the news, public service announcements, right? As as you hear about ransomware and the Colonial Pipeline is a is a most recent um, event that we've heard, and they're reading their favorite, you know, papers and and listening to others within their industry that may have had a security event or some of the things those people have been reading. Right, so the conversations are now being able to be had where they're spending the time to say, "Hey, I heard this," and Let's sit down and talk about that, right? Because I still don't, I understand cybersecurity in terms of this, it's security, but what does it mean to me? What does it mean to my business? And how can I limit the exposure and the liability that I have? So they're more willing to sit down with us and it's now turning into multiple conversations, not one, because you really need to drill down into their business, understand where they are, where they're going, how they do their business so we can uh, intelligently advise them what we can do for them and what they should be doing to protect themselves. So the, the conversations are, are now there and more willing and they're more fruitful. And I, and I, I mean, the, the funny thing is, is even if folks aren't paying attention closely, uh, things like the Colonial Pipeline a ransomware attack and the shutdown of the pipeline. I mean, it's like if you weren't paying attention, you probably got a notice when you saw the lines at the pump or saw people filling up, uh, you know, bags with gasoline at the at the at the pump, yeah, <laughs> hoarding <laughs> fuel. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's it's impossible not to pay attention today to some of the threats. Um, Peter, what what what? How has the COVID nineteen pandemic and remote work kind of shaped people's outlook on? on the challenge in general of protecting their organizations. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, the first thing that they went through, right. One path went through very similar, but we have a lot of our security uh, postures, if you will, in place. Right. So it was a little bit easier for us to quickly mobilize and go remote. Right. And you have our businesses and our clients is now going remote and people are going to be home. Right. So their first order of business was, you know, if I don't have things in the cloud and everything is in my office environment, how do I get people connected to that? So our first challenge was how to get people connected securely, right? VPN. We went through a, a long stretch of that, helping our clients get up and running and be remote. Um, and the conversations now are about, okay, 
now they're in environments that you don't really have control over, right? Because you cannot control everybody's environment at home. You just don't know what that is. Uh, I think everyone can relate if you're out on your deck and you're on your wireless and you do look at all your wireless networks in your neighborhood, you will see all your neighbors wireless networks. <laughs> uh, and I bet you there's at least one that's unsecure, right? Uh, you could get on if you really wanted to. Don't do that. <laughs> Not a good thing to do, uh, but that that happens, right? So now you've got companies there saying, all right, I got a people at home. I can't control their home network. I don't know who's coming onto their network, guests, what have you. And I don't even know how secure it is. So that was a very big challenge for them. And we sort of helped walk them through that. Right. I mean, I think it underscores, I mean, for, for years, the security industry has been talking about the how the perimeter is no longer the most important part necessarily in your cyber defense uh, because, you know, people are traveling, they're on the road, but the pandemic kind of just really exploded that concept, which is everybody is remote. Uh, everybody's outside the corporate firewall because nobody's in the office. So I think it really just underscores the need for protecting identity as, as at least one huge layer of defense. Um, what what are what what are some of the ways that that one path helps clients with uh, managing identity and making sure that who's ever logging into Microsoft's 365 or logging into applications is actually who they say they are right and that's very important because if you think about what we all went through in the last year um most more recently now not only are people remote working at home but they're now starting to venture out in your favorite coffee shop or what have you, and they can work from there. They can do work. Uh, so it's really important. Um, one of the key things I really try to advise our clients on is protect your employees, educate them, educate them, educate them. And that comes with two-factor authentication, certainly education, which we provide within our secure ID offerings. Um, educate them up, let them know. And that education comes with, with consistent periodic testing of that. And they become used to identifying things that may become within their email that they should be suspicious of. But protecting your employee is the easiest access, to, in my opinion, right, where the bad actors will go at first. So multi-factor authentication, move towards that and educate your employee base so they can identify when they get a phishing email and if it's real or not and how to act upon that. And if they take that those layered approaches that you hear a little, you'll hear a little bit more in this talk about and you start doing one at a time, then you minimize your exposure for your employees and, and no matter where they are, right? Because you know it's them and you're at least far more safer because you got that two-factor authentication. They're going to have their password and something in their hand live. So you start doing the employee base first. That's my opinion. Yeah. Well, let's let's get Carl into the conversation. So Carl, you are a OnePath client. Uh, why don't you start out and tell us a little bit about your role and your company? Thank you, Ted. Uh, I'm with a law firm, Roos and Varchetti and Olivier. Uh, we have offices in Detroit and Atlanta, and we service uh, financial recoveries for both states uh, statewide in Michigan and Georgia. Uh, my experience with OnePath has been really, really excellent so far, and I'm really happy that we're on this security discussion. We actually embarked with uh, OnePath starting that um, before COVID even hit. So we were positioning ourselves before we even knew it for success uh, in that transition to work from home. Um, as Peter was just mentioning, the, the two-factor authentication is something that if you're in business today, at least in my opinion, it's something that you have to be, you have to have your employees doing that. If you're not doing that, it, it's a walking, it's a ticking time bomb. Um, and then to touch on his employee education as well, um, the, the product that, that we've been using with them is the Know Before, and that's been really instrumental in getting our employees, uh, all of them, to be able to recognize uh, these external threats. And we so often forget about, you know, all these uh, other ways that, you know, information can seep in, like you're saying, protecting the perimeter. But once you have somebody, you know, click on that email or 
have some action from the inside, then it's a whole new, whole new ball game, a whole new threat. Well, let's let's re- let's wind the clock back before you were doing business with One Path, or were or before maybe you were intensely in, investing in security. And you mentioned something. You said you said not having multi-factor authentication is a ticking time bomb. Why? Why is that? Why, you know, wind back the clock a little bit. Talk to us about your before state. And what was worrying you about that situation, and why, um, you know, our listeners on today's call should be thinking about multi-factor? Uh, just going through uh, both with One Path and our previous IT company, looking at the logs and seeing being presented with the information of how many times, you know, our server is being pinged and trying to be accessed, and what's happening, uh, you know, on the net, and how available it really is, uh, until we were. Uh, we're, our industry is uh, highly driven by financials, and so we have a lot of the same regulations that the banks and other financial institutions have. So our regulations were in one sense mandated, uh, but that helped us to really recognize how severe the threat was because uh, a lot of the partners at the firm and other people uh, within our legal industry tend to think that it's not such a big deal or that's for somebody else that's securing you know, valuable information, but that's not the case. Uh, so really looking at and assessing the threat helped us to to see that in a way that we hadn't recognized it before. Right. I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, a lot of times people think, well, oh, we're a small business. You know, why would we why would we be attacked? You know, the, they're going to go after the big fish, not not us. Uh, the reality is if, if the, the big fish have more financial resources to invest in cybersecurity. And so their defenses probably are more uh, more more formidable for the you know, given attacker. So small businesses are threatened. And I think with uh, multi-factor authentication, the big risk is, you know, you, you mentioned executive team, you know, there will be people on your executive team who just may be having a very hairy day and being in a huge rush and they can fall easily prey to a phishing attack. And if you're only using usernames and passwords as your only method of authenticating people like executives into very important systems, if they click on the wrong thing, put that username and password into a phishing site, within no time, the hackers can have access to some of the most sensitive uh, intellectual property or privacy, you know, private client data you have in your systems. So, I mean, it can it can happen to anybody, frontline worker or an executive. Uh, it goes up and down the, the chain of command, these incidents. But so talk to us about you, you implemented one path secure ID which got you multi-factor authentication. Talk about the experience of implementing it. Um, It was really great, again, implementing that before COVID uh, because there's a learning curve for a lot of the employees as they get used to something different, having that other, you know, their cell phone or a different factor for them to have to press something or authenticate uh, that they're logging in. Uh, But doing that as a firm manager and somebody that's responsible for working with OnePath to make sure that our data and our information is safe, I slept much better at night knowing that there's that extra level of protection. It's just not, you know, somebody that's kept their same password or, you know, anything that can still be guessed and that there's, there's a real live action that has to take place for somebody to gain access to our system. Yeah. I mean, I think Microsoft says that like over like 99% of most password compromises can be stopped if you're using multi-factor authentication. And I, and I think in the, in the one path solution, it actually leverages Cisco Duo, which is, you know, an app which runs on your, you know, your mobile device. And it's really simple for the employee. You put in your username and password, boom, you get a prompt on your Duo app on your mobile phone. You click let me in and it lets you in. So it's really easy to implement, especially when it's implemented by an organization that really has a ton of experience deploying it and managing it. Um, talk to us a little bit about employee education. What have you seen? I mean, have you seen a noticeable change in how people are uh, behaving? I mean, uh, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing on the ground. We're a mid-sized law firm, uh, about 60 employees. And honestly, I was one of the people kind of in that executive group kind of pushing back on that. "Eh, I don't really know if this is a value that's going to be worthwhile for our people. I generally thought that um, perhaps our employees were uh, a bit wiser than I really recognized and having, uh, they're not quite as tech savvy as maybe some other people that have had more uh, background in that area. 
having those phishing emails, the, the, the ones where they get the training and the education on what's going on and what to look for was immensely helpful because there's so many things in phishing emails that 80 to 90% of them, you can usually identify really easily. They've got really funky you know, uh, links and stuff that's misspelled or the grammar that's just off. Uh, and some of these the employees I've gotten numerous times now where instead of them forwarding the email to me and saying, hey, is this a phishing one? Because I'd get that, you know, 10, 15, 30 times a week. I'm only seeing that, you know, once or twice now. And I, some of these are really good phishing looking ones, but it's really uh, reduced the amount of extra work that I'm looking or trying to filter through. And I know that they've even commented uh, saying that they appreciate that training and they've been able to share that information not only with you know their spouse, but also their children, because it's helpful to know these things. It's being proactive and protective in this uh, internet age. Yeah, I mean, Ted, that, could I could I yeah. could I just add two two <clears throat> things to that, right? To what to, to what Carl just touched on, right? Um, after a while, the ramp up, everything becomes normal to you. The 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 two factor authentication, you don't even know you're doing it, right? Boom, boom, boom. Your phone, you're touching things, you're you're authenticated. And after a while with the no before training and the fishing exercises that, that Carl just spoke about, you actually are looking at every single email as part of you reading email because you're looking for it and it's in your mind. And that's a good thing, right? Because people are more focused now on things that they could get in their inbox and not just addressing it quickly because they don't have the time, right? They say, is this real? And they pause for a second, and that's a great thing. So right. There was one, actually, sorry, actually there was one that, on that, which was uh, related to the, the duo. Now, with the distributed workforce that we have, a lot of people in the older days would think firewall was sufficient security, but you're not necessarily behind the corporate firewall any longer. So you might be going straight to Office 365. So needing that extra layer of security is really an important aspect. One other thing that people often overlook is that when you have Duo or something to that effect, you also have the added advantage that if for some unfortunate reason you need to terminate an employer, they leave the organization, you have a place to go in and terminate all of their access by just eliminating their token or their key. So it makes it so that you don't have quite the level of management that you had before. You don't have to worry about all the nuances and what do they have access to because you have a single system that you can go into and eliminate their access from. That's right. And I, I think, I mean, I think the, the thing that's so exciting about this is when we're talking about MFA, multi-factor authentication and duo um, and, and the employee education, it's like you're really changing behavior. You're really taking, um, you're taking it to another level. And I loved Carl's point about, you know, you know, you, you're making huge progress when you hear about employees who are, who are taking what they've learned and then applying it in their lives coaching their spouses and their children on good cybersecurity best practices. Once people become kind of advocates and evangelists for how to do this right and what to look out for, you know you're making huge progress. Um, so, so that's fantastic. I mean, a key theme for today is to think about security as layers of security or building defense in depth. Um, so we've talked a lot about the, 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 the perimeter has vanished, uh, managing identity, building the human firewall. But there are still the bad guys are relentless. And I, I want to get Dave in the I want to get Dave in the conversation and talk to us about uh, talk to us about still some of the the, the challenges. I mean, what yeah. is an advanced persistent threat? Talk to us a little right. bit about True. about these challenges. One thing I do want to interject a little bit on I actually have some really interesting stats about multi-factor authentication. I attended a talk at RSA, which is a big security conference that a lot of us nerds go to. Um, I think it was in 2020. And Microsoft arguably processes more login events a day than anyone, right? So back in like mm, 2020, like January to 2020, they did a talk and they said, look, we process 30 billion login events a day. And in January of 2020, they had 1.2 million accounts that were compromised. Does anybody want to guess even remotely how many of those compromised accounts did not have multi-factor authentication? Any numbers? Oh, 100%. <laughs> Greater than 99.9%. Wow. So if that doesn't speak to the effectiveness of what uh, multi-factor authentication does, and if there's any nerds in the crowd that want to just Google breaking password dependencies, Microsoft, they have like an hour long. They recorded the whole thing. It's really good if you want to learn about that. But it just really speaks to the um, 
uh, to the effectiveness of multi-factor authentication. And I believe it was Scott that had the point that was like, if you have to terminate an employee or if someone's device is lost or whatever, you can shut that device down from multi-factor and you can, you know, even if you're waiting a little bit to figure out what happened, you've got time to do that. So it's super effective. And that's one of the challenges that has been faced forever. It wasn't that long ago that multi-factor was only available to enterprises, spending a lot of money. Everybody probably remembers maybe they had a friend that worked at a bank or something like that and had the little keychain with the like little eight numbers that changed yeah. every. That's what multi-factor was 10 years ago. Uh, but now it's, you know, it's on a phone, it's on my watch, it's on. So it's really just an inexpensive way to shore things up really, really quick. And one of the huge challenges that I, I keep hearing a lot of things repeatedly, right? We're talking about um, educating people and perimeterless network. From right before COVID to after COVID, the same number of computers that we were monitoring at that time, we saw the number of different IP addresses or places on the internet that they were calling to us from triple, like basically in like a month as everybody started going distributed and going from home. And that presented huge challenges, right? We, we've talked about that already. I can't stress enough on education. It's something that we do here at Huntress. It's something that everybody should do all the way down to educating your spouses and your friends. And, you know, hey, my mom forwards me emails all the time. Is this a scam or not? So <laughs> huge challenge, right? Um, advanced persistent threat sounds really, really cool. And really, it's just got that like, you know, sexy NSA, DOD, whatever kind of vibe to it. But all it really is, is I'm an attacker who spent a lot of time getting into your computer, right? It doesn't sound like, you know, I'm not going after you specifically. A lot of these things are um, automated to get that first phase done. All those fish, no one's sending 10,000 phishing emails by hitting send and outlook a bunch of times, right? It's an automated process. That education is just massively key because as an attacker, I'm going to tell you, it's way easier to hack the squishy thing behind the keyboard than the actual computer. It's, it's just, it's infinitely easier. But all that means is persistent threat. That means once I'm in, I want to stay in. Right. It, it was a lot of effort to get someone to click that email. If I had to make you click my spam email every day, I'd be the worst hacker on the planet. Right. So inefficient. Right. So once I'm in, I want to stay in. And that's where that defense in depth comes in. Right. That's where those layers of products that are looking in all those different places that can look for those types of threats. So those are the challenges. Right. It's it's sometimes it's the crazy super, you know, zero day never heard of before attack. But more often than not, it's simple things. It's the simple things that can shore you up really, really well in attacks. And it's these things like two factor and making sure things are up to date and making sure people are educated. So, yeah, I mean, so they're, so they're, per, they're persistent. And that mm -hmm. kind of leads to the next question is like, well, how long are they there? And I think it's yeah. maybe important to describe this concept of dwell time yeah. and, and, and share a little That's bit about cool. what people think about, like how hackers really behave when they yeah. get into a system or a network. Yeah, that's a term that that's actually been really popular is dwell time, right? There's this huge, another nerd report, right? Verizon data breach investigation report. It's like Christmas when it comes out every year for all of us in cybersecurity because we want to read all the stats they gather because they have lots of good data. Um, and that number of dwell time when an attacker gets in and stays in, they're usually in around 100 days. Um, hey, to be fair, it used to be 180. But I'll be honest, yeah. as an attacker, those two numbers are the same. Um, I can do anything in 100 days that I could have done in 180. Um, but what they're doing is in some cases, they're just gathering information about your network. I actually worked on a forensic case years ago where um, before my Huntress days, um, where an attacker got into a financial institution. It was a credit union. Um, and they just stayed in there long enough to like read emails, gather forms, find signatures, copy mannerisms of people. And then they started like issuing totally valid looking documents from valid email addresses to do money transfers. And it, 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 it's, it's an amount of money that is extremely uncomfortable for, for a credit union of that size to, to determine that they had lost. And, and, you know, it was FBI involvement due to the amount of money that was taken. So that's what they're doing. Attackers will get in and stay in. Um, now, um, things with like ransomware and stuff, it's like, um, it's, it's like an extortion play. We've stolen all your data, and if you don't pay us, we're going to release it. So they are gathering things that they think are of value necessarily to you, or would it hurt you greatly if you if that got released to the public, right? So there's a lot of different angles that attackers can play. So the idea of reducing dwell time down to, excuse me, we have a, we have a visitor here. We're going to pass him on. Um, you know, <laughs> we're just trying to reduce the amount of time that attackers spend in uh, a system, and that's, that's where that defense in depth comes in.
You guarantee right, so, the cat will show up in a webinar that I'm in. I'm sorry. It's just, uh, <laughs> it just happens. So dwell time. It's the time that uh, the bad guys will sp stay inside of a network or on a system to, to find the right, mm -hmm. you know, social context yeah. to just, then social engineer other people inside the organization yeah. to send those wire, those wires or to do those financial transfers that mm -hmm. are fraudulent um, or to yeah. find the other chinks in the armor to unleash the ransomware yeah. attack or, yeah. or move laterally inside the organization. Um, Absolutely. A lot of the malware we see, one of its prime functions is to figure out what security products and what defensive and offensive products might be present on the system. And, you know, seeing what versions of all those are, and then they'll use databases of things online to see if any of that's exploitable or, you know, they just want to gather as much information as possible. It's really, it's just kind of like basic war tactics, right? Learn everything you can about your target. Right. And I guess another one that really uh, drives folks kind of, uh, well, at least keeps me awake at night is they use the dwell time to uh, turn off the backups, you know, figure oh, out yeah. how the backup system is in place. And, you know, before you unleash the ransomware attack, uh, you uh, turn off the backups or destroy the backups, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very common to see destroyed backups in ransomware cases now. It's extremely common. As we're talking about this layered approach, backups is a really key element, in my opinion, yeah. to this entire process. It's not only do we have to have the good protection at the end user level, making sure they're trained, making sure they have the right tools on their systems to monitor things, but then it's also to make sure that we have everything in place in case somebody still makes the accident and clicks that button and downloads that ransomware, that we have recovery points. And it's not just enough to think that you have them, but to actually test them and prove that you have them and make sure that they're running effectively and efficiently all the time. Yeah, that's right. And and I think, you know, the I, I, I actually had a discussion with another person from Huntress earlier in the week, and there's a really nice graph they or kind of graphic they showed that really uh, in cybersecurity, we spent a lot of a lot of investment trying to prevent the infection, mm -hmm. you know, prevent the bad guys from getting in yeah. or prevent the malware infection up front. And we spent a lot of investment on the back end, investing in backup technology to be that last line of defense. But we haven't invested much in, um, you know, monitoring, you know, monitoring if something actually, if someone actually has gotten in and then reacting and responding to get them out. And that's yep. been kind of an underinvestment area. And Dave, maybe kind of talk about what um, managed detection and response or endpoint uh, detection yeah. and response, how does, it, how does it work? Yeah, so I know exactly the graphic you're talking about. And it's a really good way to show how kind of cybersecurity has evolved over time. And it's based on the NIST cybersecurity framework. So it's just a government kind of created thing showing us like all the layers of security we should invest in to have a complete system. You're absolutely right. The last decade or so, we focused heavily on that protection, stopping things from happening. But that managed detection response area you're bringing up here is those products are unaware when they've been defeated. Um, you know, an antivirus doesn't know when some cr cleverly crafted code runs that's bad. Um, so that's where that threat response comes in, right? Where, you know, tools are monitoring in that area is those like, hey, what changes are being made? What things are being done that maybe would establish persistence, right? There's usually some key elements where we can see, hey, as an attacker tried to stay in? Uh, and when they do, right, those are the types of things that we monitor and alert on. But that went unignored for so long. And then a lot of money was invested in backups. And we saw the attackers change their landscape too, right? Because first early ransomware, it was like, well, we'll just spend a lot of money on backups. If we get ransomed, we'll restore the backup and then we'll all be good, right? Well, then the attackers were like, okay, well, now we'll just steal all your data and extort you. We don't care about your backup, right? Like, you know, what is like, we'll post all of your company secrets and all of your dirty laundry on the dark web if you don't pay us money. So it takes time to orchestrate attacks like that more often than not. So that's where that's the key factor of reducing that dwell time we've been talking about is that managed detection and response area. That's those tools that are used to look for signs of compromise. Um, you know, a lot of those tools, uh, including ours, they don't actually stop things from happening. The, the, the design of the tool is to like look for changes that looks like something was broken through prevention and then alert everyone accordingly to get people moving quicker. Because if we can reduce 100 days of dwell times down to the day of that significantly reduces the ability of those attackers to gather information and do whatever nefarious things they were planning to do with your data. And I guess, I mean, an... go ahead, Sorry, Scott. It's important to note that when these attackers are in the system, it's not 
going to be deemed a virus. It's not going to be found right. by virus scanners. So this isn't going to be your typical yeah. event that a virus scanner is going to find. This is a third party who's actually breached your system mm -hmm. inside playing around having a field day. Yeah, and they're they're often doing it with with trusted tools, like built in components of Windows yeah. itself. So in a lot of cases, those preventive tools aren't going to flag those as something wrong because they're just it's called living off the land, right? It's it's they're just abusing things that are already there. It helps them fly well under the radar. Um, but to establish that persistence and those things, they have to make changes to the system, and that's what those that's what those detect and response tools are designed to look for. Yeah, and. Circling back to what I said at the top, right? What are we hearing from the customers? When we talk about everything that Dave just said, right? Somebody's in there. Nobody knows they're there and they just stay and gather. It's a wow moment. Wow. They could be there and you never know. Years ago, yeah. And that's what they're going to try to do. They're just going to try and sit there and gather information and do what they need to do. And mm -hmm. if you don't detect and you don't react, you never well, know they're so there. They yeah. I mean, Scott mentioned Scott and Dave just mentioned something kind of frightening a little bit is that they're they're using they're using tools that look normal. They're living off right. the land. They're using traditional Windows uh, technologies to uh, you know look around and spy on what's happening. So, Dave, talk to us about what um, what a detection and response uh, solution does. I mean, are you looking at the behavior or so how does it how does it work? There are there are a lot of different you know methodologies and approaches and whatnot. Uh, one of Huntress's primary approach is um, we know that more often than not attackers want to stay in. It's going to take them a while to craft what they're going to do. So our tool monitors for areas of persistence on the machine. So there's probably some that even end users know about persistence. There's some things like whenever they install something and they're like, hey. Um, start weather bug on every reboot, right? So you get your little weather icon on every reboot. Well, that's technically a persistence mechanism, right? Everything that's down there in the bottom right-hand corner of your computer by the clock, every one of those little helpful icons for your weather information or your antivirus or your whatever, every one of like, technically that's a persistence mechanism. So it, one of our big methodologies is to look for changes in those, right? Antivirus is often like, hey, is this thing bad? What behavior is it? Whereas our approach is, why is this even starting up in the first place? Does it have a reason to? Why is it here? Who are you? What are you doing here? Let me see your ID, that kind of thing. Um, and that's that's one of the approaches that we have is we're like, hey, if anything new is set to automatically run in any way on this computer, why? What does it do? Where did it come from? Um, because a lot of well-known tools can be weaponized pretty easily. So it's not just the existence of the tool itself that's bad. It's the manner in which it's being used. So we look at all that. We look at all the things that are being passed to it and how it's being integrated into other things. And then when we find something that is, you know, definitely a little bit shady or, or terribly shady, we will alert our partners and, and you know, one path in this instance, and then they mobilize, you know, in whatever manner that they do through their their workflows. Right. So it so then it comes down to responding, and what we're trying mm -hmm. to do is take that dwell time from 100 days down to one, or yeah. you know cut it cut it dramatically because yep. if you are cutting the bad guys off in terms of their time, then they have less time to plot their next big yeah. uh, attack, and 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 you can cut them off at the pass, so to yeah. speak. Um, and so yep. the way Huntress works with one path is the the you guys are in close cooperation in the security operations center with one mm -hmm. path. And then you guys can go take remedial action, uh, to kick the gut, kick the guys out, uh, you know, yeah. uh, refresh those machines, take them offline, do whatever you need to do. So let's, let's, uh, Scott and Anthony, you know, we've heard that when you guys roll out Huntress to clients, you often have interesting stories that pop up right away. Can you, can you share some of those examples you've heard with us? Yeah, Anthony, do you want to address that one? You, you've been working a lot with it on lately. Yeah, so a, a lot of stuff that ends up happening uh, is that we'll find, uh, I mean, I won't, I won't say that whether or not this particular situation has happened quite recently or not, but um, yeah, when we turned on uh, some canaries, we found out that they got encrypted almost immediately, right? So then mm. uh, I guess canaries, I guess, Dave, you can go into it if you want to go in, uh, into a lot more detail as to like what those things uh, kind of are. But it's it's kind of like uh, what they, what the miners yeah. used to use, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit. Um, uh, canaries is basically, um, you know, in dwell time, 
that's really when attackers are hanging out and figuring what's going on. A canary comes in sort of after the attacker has pulled the proverbial trigger. What we want to do is we want to basically you're right. You're right down the, the road on that. We call them ransomware canaries and other people do too. It's not a term we made up, but it's from the old canary in a coal mine. Um, miners would take canaries who were sensitive to gases like carbon monoxide and whatnot, and they would have it in a cage. And if they saw the bird pass out or die or something terrible, then they would know to get out of there real quickly. So we do the same thing with uh, files. We don't harm any birds, just just innocuous files on a computer, right? Um, so yeah, it's totally, totally safe by all my PETA and all of them. Um, so we'll place files in strategic places on a computer that we expect to get encrypted early in a ransomware process. Again, it's not stopping ransomware because there's already tools you have in place to try to do that, your preventive solutions. But we're trying to say, hey, if something gets through, how can we reduce that response time? Ransomware as a whole, encryption is a very mathematical uh, intensive process, right? Like it's, it takes a while to do it, it's whatnot. So if we can reduce the amount of time that's happening and help folks like Anthony and their team respond uh, to it quicker, they can get that machine shut down, isolated and out of the way before it causes, because most ransomware these days will spread to other computers if you let it run long enough. Um, so yeah, hopefully that gives you some idea of where the canary came from. But uh, Anthony, yeah, definitely finish your, your story on that one. Yeah, so basically what we discovered is when we uh, started launching Huntress in their environment, we noticed that some of these files started tripping, right? So then we pulled the plug on the internet, right? Because we don't want necessarily want to turn off the machine full stop. We want to be able to do some forensic analysis and pull data off of off of RAM and, and, uh, and the OS so that we can try and get a little bit more information as to what's going on. But basically, like what these canaries are supposed to do is reduce that 180 days, that 100 days down to maybe almost an instant as soon as like that ransomware starts going. I mean, they, they probably had a foothold in the environment before we showed up. Right. But at the same time, when we, when we showed up and we deployed these things and we saw these things starting to encrypt, we were able to jump on the issue far more quickly than uh, I guess, like maybe one of your employees looking at their files and it's like, Hey, how come I don't have access to this anymore? Wait, why did my machine turn off? Wait, why do I now have this message that says I owe them a lot of money? Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and, I think, um, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I, if, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit to the life cycle of um, a, a attack that usually is ransomware, right? So it might help a little bit uh, with, with clarity on it. What normally happens is that first layer, the, the phishing email or the bad links that go out, that is usually some automated process by attackers, right? They send out 100,000 emails, maybe 10,000 people open them, maybe 100 people actually click and run the malware. But what happens is, their persistent malware loads and it informs them, right? They get like a kind of like you would get a ticket notification like, hey, you've, you've got this new thing to do. They get this queue that they have to work through of all their targets. So it, it takes them a little bit of time to go through all of the, the <laughs> compromised machines. So it might take them a little while to get to you to find out um, if they want to ransom you one way or another, if they want to download data, if they just want to encrypt it and charge you money. So if we can react you know early on in that foothold part as soon as they get that malware running more often than not we can stop um the ransomware from even happening but if we do get to the phase of ransomware happening fastest response is key so hopefully that helps clear up kind of the life cycle of how those attacks work thank goodness for uh ticket backlogs with the hackers yeah. you know <laughs> <Right>. yeah <laughs> yeah uh, but I, I think it, i think this discussion kind of underscores a really important thing is that there's a huge human dimension to cyber defense today. And, and when you partner with a company like OnePath, you have a security operations center. You have literally human beings that are working around the clock uh, to monitor all of this technology and to take action, even if it's the middle of the night. Uh, can Scott or Anthony, can you talk a little bit about the OnePath SOC and, and you know, how you really you know, do something for clients that they probably, in most cases, couldn't really do on their own? So this particular incident that I was kind of bringing up actually happened at two o'clock in the morning, right? So like we got a notification that like, you know, something got tripped. So we went to look at it and the guy was in there actually actively encrypting it. So we were able to pull the plug on the network, right? And be able to try and lock him out. And we've been able to like work with different like uh, uh, technologies and, and our vendors to really get that stuff locked out. Um, we've been changing obviously like the rules on the firewall. And uh, yeah, but it's without having something like those canaries, like from Huntress, um, it would have been very difficult, especially at two o'clock in the morning for any for any of the uh, the employees for this particular client to, to really see the stuff coming across. 
one of the other things that we have done is created a pretty comprehensive incident response plan. So when an incident does happen, obviously the first step is to identify that there is an incident and declare it an incident. We then, in essence, pull out the rule book and just march down the path of exactly what's going to happen. We inform our team in the order that it needs to be informed in and start taking corrective actions immediately. Part of that is training all of our team to know exactly what to do when that incident hits. So it's not just a surprise, you know, what am I supposed to do quick, just shut the machine off. We want to do it in a more of a proactive approach, knowing that the idea is we're going to go back and find out how they got in, what they took, what they did, so that we can then start protecting it moving forward. And obviously, every time we do this, and this happens because customers may not have all the tools in place or something else may have happened, we learn from it, and then we start using that to kind of build our tool set to make sure that the next group of people may not have that experience. So yeah, it's absolutely. Just a living and breathing process. Right. Yeah, and because I think like that the forensic data that we're pulling off of these things right. helps protect not just the client that got affected, but all of our clients, because we have the ability to see where this attacker is coming from, and we can prevent that from getting to the other clients that we have. I want right. to jump in and, and make a point here. It's, it's yeah, really interesting ahead, what Scott and Anthony said that it's a team of people that are working around the clock to do that because a lot of small or mid-sized businesses even, even if you've got the finances to have you know a one or two person staff to, to run all this, you still have a limited number of eyes that are, that are reviewing the data and looking at it. It is so important to have a group of individuals that are all highly classified, that's their skill set, that that's what they're doing on a regular basis. They're up to date and knowing it. It's not, you're not just you know, handing it off to one person and saying, oh, this is the person that's all on their shoulders. That's that's too much responsibility for a single person. I love that you said that there's a team and that's what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. and there's yeah. another aspect to it, Good. which is a lot of managed services, they have their team. They might even have a SOC, but it's not a 24-7 SOC. So by the time they actually see that alert the next morning at 8 o'clock when they get to their office, it's too late. The systems are encrypted. The, the hacker's already been in there and having a field day. So having that true 24-7 environment is really a kind of a differentiator and a big standout because it, it makes it so that we're actually proactive all day, every day, 24-7. Yeah, and if and something to add there is what everybody is saying here. It's pretty instantaneous, right? We deliver reports to our customers that, that have the hunters uh, within their environment, and we walk through some of those events that do happen, right? And you can actually see within the ticketing how fast somebody, how fast the alert was generated, where it went, how fast somebody got to look at it, and went and remediated where, where appropriate, right? So sometimes that's 10, 15 minutes. And that's pretty, that's pretty quick in terms of getting alerted, getting eyes on it, and then taking some level of action right then, 10, 15 minutes, really good. Right, I want to, and I want to get our, our audience in the conversation here. So I want to remind everybody who's joining us live, please, uh, we've got some great experts uh, on deck here. Uh, ask your questions, use either the attendee chat or the Q&A log. Uh, but I, there's a great question in the, in the log here, and I got to get this in front of Dave, but how do we deal with adv advanced persistent cats? Oh, that's really tough, actually. Um, that's actually been one of the biggest problems I've ever had here. Um, uh, usually, usually uh, jiggle a treat bag or something like that, maybe a, a jar of cat. That's usually the best way. Uh, He's one of the founders, I think. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. So another question. So I, I think this one um, kind of maybe goes back to Carl, and, and maybe, Peter, you could add some color here, too. But... Um, you know, I think this kind of goes back to implementing uh, secure ID or multi-factor authentication or employee education. Uh, so the question is, how did you prep your employees for the change? Um, because we know, and this is part of the question, because we know the most difficult part of rolling out this is the people. Uh, what can they share in terms of helping others introduce this to their company and get buy-in? So what were, you know, how did you prepare the ground or get that buy-in for implementing sure. uh, big changes? Uh, Kyle, I mean, I'll start and then you can sort of color in your experience with it, right? So what we do is, again, we want to make make our customers very comfortable with the process, right? Our professional services team does a fantastic job. We'll explain it to folks like Carl, who can then can explain it to their individuals you know, within, their, within their company, how it's going to work, what happens, and have some training around it, right? So it's not a drop and cut. It's a process that we go through and we may, 
you know, identify some key individuals to start with as a test ground to make sure things in their envi uh, environment as you roll out to, uh, to FA work nicely, right? And once you do that, then it's a go register, slow roll, good instructions, education up front again, training around that, make sure everybody is comfortable. And then on the back end on the go live day, we're there sort of like a war room type of environment that we can help folks that, that are going live, right? And that's sort of our plan of attack on it is to go slow, train, do some testing, and then be there after you go live. Absolutely. Carl, just, any to build on, just to build on what Peter was saying, um, there's a process and one path has it and they lay it out for you. And it starts with the educational component of explaining it to us, the client, what the product is, what it's used for and why it's important. And that why it's important part is really critical because if the rest of the management team, if the owners, if they don't get on board, if they don't understand the value that's being provided, they're not gonna you know, look at it with the seriousness that they might otherwise do it. They might look at it, oh, this is just one of those you know, webinars that I'm gonna sit and click through for 30 minutes and there might be five questions at the end. They need to understand why it's being done and the importance of, of that education. Uh, and then, like you said, too, once that's been established, you have a schedule and you pick a, a small test group to roll it out. You test out the kinks, you make sure everything's flowing smoothly, and then roll out to the rest of the staff. But as far as education and rolling it out, you let the staff know this is what's going to be happening. It's important because we're trying to secure our company and secure our, our jobs and our, our livelihoods to make sure that we're not going to become a victim to any of these threats that are happening that we're very aware, like you mentioned, the colonial pipeline, all these different things. We're more aware of it in the news today and people are more willing now to, to put a little bit more of their own time and effort into it because instead of, you know, sitting and, you know, just reading the, the news or the Yahoo, what's up on, you know, the most recent thing, they're actually looking at the links that they're clicking on and the pages that they're going to and thinking that if I click on this, if I go there, there could be a substantial impact, not only for myself, but this organization. So it's that educational rollout, and that's that's really the process. Just being transparent about why you're doing it. You're not doing it to you know trap employees or catch them. And you're you know you're the bad one that's always clicking on the links. It's we're really trying to make sure that we're safe and secure as an organization. And Carl, yeah, as, I'm sorry. As sorry, you talk about it, it goes a little bit beyond that, in my opinion, as well, because it also gives that employee the education they need to incorporate some of that into their personal lives so that they're not using that same username and password for their Gmail account and then they're, you know, pick Cole's password and every other account that they're logged into. And they start learning when they go into these systems where it gives them the opportunity to do 2FA, such as Gmail, that they should enable it. And it becomes part of a normal life and normal process because these are how people are getting compromised. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with that have the same password for absolutely everything under the sun. And they don't know if those are good accounts and good systems that they're putting their username and password into, but they're getting their email, they're getting their password. They need to make sure they have 2FA installed on pretty much everything that they can, their bank accounts, their personal emails, plus all the corporate stuff. So that training really goes hand in hand with teaching them how to be more secure in everything that they do. Yeah, and I think, I think the overall point about like just when you're rolling this out to your staff, there's a really core component of adult education, which is what's in it for me and, and really connecting the dots with the what's, you know, what's in it for every employee in the company um, in terms of protecting the organization, which protects my livelihood, which protects my family, which protects me. Uh, you know, so you've really got to connect the dots there uh, to plow past that kind of buy in challenge you're always going to face and when anytime you introduce anything that's change oriented in an organization. So um, uh, another question, uh, just kind of to go in a slightly different direction, uh, Dave, talk to us a little bit about um, what you guys are seeing with how the ransomware threat is evolving. You, you mentioned data exfiltration or data theft or yeah. uh, what's, um, what's happening there. Cause that's kind of really an interesting dimension to the yeah, challenge. I, I, I'll rewind a little bit just from, for entertainment value, right? Like I remember the first ransomware attack that I saw, like from a commercial standpoint, right? It was it was the old crypto locker, and they made people go out and get green dot money pack gift cards. And I don't know if anybody knows what those are, but they're basically reloadable like credit cards. So the attacker would go buy the card, and the way that you paid your ransom is you'd go to a Walmart or Walgreens or whatever, and you'd buy a reload card and give them the code. That's how they took money. And I remember just telling everybody I was working with at the time that like this is a thing now, like this is the future. 
and uh, jokingly, I was like kind of mad I didn't think of it first. I was a little jealous, <laughs> but um, but no, it was it was. But that was still a terrible way to like, you know, there was a credit card type thing and whatever. But then, uh, does anybody want to take any guesses as to what like made ransomware super viable? Cryptocurrency. Um, a, a, a great way to yeah. anonymously pay without any tracking or any of that stuff. So that really has revolutionized ransomware. And in the early days, it was it was difficult to buy cryptocurrency. In the last yeah. year or year before, I was in Vegas for a conference and I saw a Bitcoin ATM machine, right? Or ATM, it's ATM machines redundant. Anyway, um, you know, it's 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 weird now, right? Cryptocurrency is a normal thing. You can buy and trade it on well-known stock apps on your phone, right? So now that's the revolution that we're seeing is it, 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 there's like these ransomware folks have developed an entire business model in the same way that vendors and things you may deal with have a business model. They have a legitimate affiliate program. They have packages you can buy. You can buy ransomware as a service if you're like kind of shady, but not shady enough to run the whole operation on your own. Right. Like maybe I didn't maybe I don't write my own ransom. Maybe I'm not a developer, but I have access to a lot of juicy targets so I can actually team up. You know, I can sign up as a affiliate with a ransomware vendor and then install it on all these things and they'll pay me a cut of the ransom. So there are you know, we've done talks before where we've shown showcased like forums, screenshots from forums and stuff on the dark web where people are like, I have access to a thousand machines. I want 50 percent. Right. So it's like you know, that, that's kind of a crazy thing. And then you'll, we'll see the affiliate programs, right? Like, oh, if you are kind of this junior bronze level, you only get these things and you can step up. They have customer support. They have like 24 seven support for like ransomware vendors and stuff. So the, the, the revolution that we're seeing isn't so much in the technology. The ransomware itself is often pretty basic. It's just a tool that runs and encrypts things and sends the keys off to a private server. And then you pay them and they give you the keys, but the delivery methods and the complexity behind the the just full economy and business operation that they're running behind it. We've seen talks of like, um, uh, you know, folks that were, um, uh, you know, they they didn't they didn't perform well enough, so they got kicked out of the affiliate program. They had to go find another, you know. So it's really crazy. We've also seen the ransomware actors themselves set up direct to customer support. Hey, are you having trouble finding a way to buy Bitcoin? We're more than happy to, to do that for you. We're more than happy yes. to locate that for you. Are you having some trouble with your decryptor? Right, yeah, are you having trouble with the decryptor not working right? We'll help you with that because the ransomware attackers wanna be known as if, hey, you pay us, we give you your data. Um, a couple, There's one really popular ransom note from like Ryuk or Soda Nakibi, one of the really popular ones. It says, uh, it's not personal, it's just business. Like that's a sentence in it, right? They don't care who you are. They don't care that you're a lawyer or they don't care that you're a doctor. They don't care that you are, you know, I don't know, selling pecans on the side of the road. If they've encrypted your POS system, then they, they just want their money and they want to be known that, hey, if you pay us, we'll unencrypt your data. So the real complexity in the attacks has been how organized and how uh, how smart they are. They have like go to market plans. They have branding. They have, you know, all they the have stuff customer that, service representatives. Yeah, they have they have like <laughs> live chat. They have live chat customer service representatives. They're fluent in multi languages, right? They don't want there to be any impeding process to getting their money. Um, and some of them even offer you security tips. They're like, hey, this is how we got in. You should totally do these things to make sure that you <laughs> go don't buy this. Active. Yeah, go oh, do this grief. stuff, right? <laughs> Read a, read a resume that has a uh, you know customer service representative ransomware. Right, yeah. <laughs> top top agent, right? You know, team leader, right? You know, it, it's just it's an interesting to see them build that now because um, you know, and a lot of them are sort of operating in you know foreign countries and basements and stuff like that. But I mean, there's probably operations just about everywhere. You know, any anywhere you've got internet and 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 you know whatever tools you need to hide reasonably enough. So. I think that's been what has kind of shocked me the most is just how absolutely organized and meticulous and together they are. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, yeah, ransom. Uh, I saw a message. It looks like it's an attendee chat. Ransomware is a service. Absolutely. Yeah. They sell it as just a total service. Like, like I said, if you're that half shady person, uh, Hey, I don't know how to write ransomware, but I've got access to a lot of juicy targets. Sign me up. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll work out a deal. Um, uh, that's hypothetical. I wouldn't actually do that. I'm totally get fired. But yeah, uh, should, yeah you you 100 yeah. use your talents to fight evil. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> only yeah. using powers for good for sure. But yeah, so that <laughs> that has been the most shocking to me. Uh, there have been a few little interesting technologies that they've used and leveraged, like 
I don't know, just weird ways to execute things using virtual machines and, and odd thing, you know, getting real nerdy and technical. But mostly what has shocked me, like I said, is just the sheer business they've made out of it, like a legitimate business with like there's pecking order and ranks and 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 all that. It's just it's pretty wild to see. And it's it's just going to continue. Uh, there's only like thirty seven hundred different cryptocurrencies now. So when they get tired of using Bitcoin, like, I don't know, like, Dogecoin or something. Yeah. Well, this is what this is what we're up against, and this is what yeah. one path clients and prospective clients are up against. And you know, kind of to, to bring things back to one of our themes is um, you need layers of defense, and, and we've talked about two major ones, which is one path secure ID, which is uh, employee education, security awareness programming, multi factor authentication, and single sign on, of um, all in a single package, and endpoint threat detection. So, Peter, let me bounce it to you. We, we On these calls, uh, we get uh, OnePath clients who maybe don't have all the layers of defense in place yet, um, mm -hmm. or we have potentially organizations that are looking to make a change or step into a different managed service relationship. How should people engage? How should people get started? Yeah, so if you are a current client of ours, right, I, I implore you to talk to your account team, right? It, it, it really gets down to talking it out, having that account team learn about your business. And so we can educate ourselves what you're doing, what some of the challenges are, and we can offer the solutions to secure that up, right? So it is about having the conversations, spending that time to do so. Um, right. Right. And, and, and if, you're, if you're not doing business with OnePath today, simply go to the OnePath.com website, engage, right. and a thorough risk assessment is a part of their onboarding process to understand um, what you need in a new relationship. So, um, uh, so with that, I, I want to thank all of our speakers today. Hugely interesting conversation. We took it in a lot of different directions. Thank you to the cats that joined as well um, on the webinar. Um, but and thank you to our live audience for for joining us and asking questions. Um, this was a one path exec tech. Uh, webinar. And we look forward to having you join us on a future One Path event. And to our speakers, thanks everybody for sharing all your insights and wisdom. Thank you very much and have a great day. Take right. care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye now.